Heavenly Father, we just beg you this evening to come and open our eyes to understand the scriptures. Help us to see what you're doing in the Old Testament, in Genesis in particular, in Jacob and Esau's lives, and how our Jesus makes things different as well. Please give us an attentiveness to you and ability to hear what you want to say to us this evening for right now, as well as to store up treasure for the future. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Well, the camera guys are going to have to work a bit again this evening. Um, so we've got the whiteboard out. And um, we might have to do a, a little bit of millionaire on this if, if we need help with a quiz. Um, but first of all, first question for everyone this evening. Uh, who is the crucial character in the book of Genesis? Um, I'll give you a clue if you need it, but probably the most crucial character in the book of Genesis. He's so crucial, he came up in our Galatian series that we were doing not long ago. Uh, and Abraham, okay, Father Abraham, right. So up here we've got Abraham. And we're just going to give him a bit of a family tree. I can't, I can't spell Abraham, but there you go. Uh, Abraham. And Abraham married this side of the room. Anyone know? Sarah. Yes, Nev knows. Nev is married to a Sarah, so good that you know. Interestingly, um, for the elite among you, what was Abraham called at the beginning of the story? Just Abraham, yeah. Had, had a little name. And Sarah was called? Sarah, you're very good. You for bringing it home here tonight. So we've got Abraham and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah, and they are like the founding fathers of the Jewish people. Okay, they have two children, um, but only one who sort of counts um, going forward in the story, and his name is Isaac. Very good. Uh, anyone know what Isaac means for an additional bonus point um, this side of the room? Anyone know what Isaac means? Any Isaacs in the room? Anyone got a middle name? Anyone know? It means laughing, absolutely, because his mum was so, thought it was so hilarious that she was going to have a kid because she was so old, so he can't possibly have a kid. Anyway, she gets super favourite son, Isaac, um, and he gets married to a woman from back home called Rebecca. Um, anyone know the biblical way to get a wife uh, from that bit of Genesis? How, how do you get a wife if you want to do it the Isaac and Rebecca style? You send camels and who, who, takes the, who takes the camels? Yeah, one of your dad's servants basically rocks up in a foreign country and whichever woman happens to water the camels, um, as long as she's beautiful enough, gets taken home to marry the master's uh, son, Isaac. So Isaac marries Rebecca. Um, now, Isaac has a traumatic thing that happens to him early on in his life. Anyone know what Freudian drama he has to go through uh, early on in his life? It's in American History X, if you're more of a film buff than a Bible buff. Yes, Becky. He nearly gets sacrificed on a mountain, yeah? So his daddy takes him up a mountain and uh, to sort of see whether he really loves God or not, he's prepared to stick his, uh, his son, let's, let's make him a little stick man here, um, on a uh, fiery pyre uh, and burn him. This is the, the child that he's been promised all through his life. And actually, that is quite a common practice in the pagan countries around. They would sacrifice horrifically to the gods. And partly the story is about God saying, you don't need to do that. Um, I will provide for you. It's actually faith uh, that is going to save you, not uh, sacrifices. So Isaac sits in between Abraham and, uh, and his um, key son. Um, begins with a J. Jacob, yeah, there you go. His key son, who is actually not his firstborn son. He is his... Yes, that was genius. Uh, and his oldest son is called... Esau. Way! It was worth going to Sunday school all those years. Um, or it was worth trying to do the Bible in the year and, and getting as far as January the 16th. Uh, either way, <laughs> you've got as far as Jacob and Esau. Okay, now these two are a special kind of siblings. They are they're twins. And right from being in their mummy's womb, let's, let's draw a mummy's womb. <laughs> okay, there you are. Uh, right from being in mummy's womb, 
these, these, little, these little babies are fighting with one another. Uh, that, that's... There you, there you go. Uh, they're, 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 fighting, they're fighting in the womb. And it is prophesied that the oldest one is going to serve the youngest one as he gets a bit bigger. There you are. He's developing into... Uh, there you are. He's got into the second trimester now. Um, he's, he's developing. And he is going to one day have to serve uh, his older brother, his younger brother, brother. Uh, they get born. And the younger one comes out grabbing the heel of the elder one. Right from the get-go, they're pretty much fighting. And Jacob, the younger one, who is the key one in this line, is going to be trying to get everything he can from Esau. Now, why are we doing this when we're talking about the story of the prodigal son? Uh, The reason is, and have we got the the slide on there? Um, It's from this morning still. Sam might be able to get it up. The reason is, there's a very great theologian called Kenneth Bailey, who has written a book recently called Jacob and the Prodigal. And he says that when Jesus tells a story and says there was a father who had two sons, um, all of the people around him who read the first five books of the Bible back to back on cycle would have gone, yeah, I know that story. There was a father who had two sons. Now, in our culture, that's not that strange because, frankly, if you get to two, you know, most people go, yep, that's it. I'm done. In fact, I heard a, heard a story about a little boy who said he'd overheard his mum and dad talking and they said that they were, they were having a baby and uh, if it was a girl, he, he says, I, I know what it's going to be called. So I know what it's going to be called if it's a boy as well. So, oh, gone in. So it's going to be Emily if it's a girl. Um, and if it's a boy, uh, it's going to be quits. <laughs> it's going to be called quits. Um, because in our culture, you pretty much stop. Um, but in their culture, it's very unusual. In fact, Abraham, who had famously Isaac and Ishmael, once Sarah died, he had at least six more children afterwards. There were tons of them. Oh, loads and loads. Uh, Esau here, he managed to marry two sort of regular pagans around him, had a bunch of kids there. Uh, but Isaac, Jacob and Esau were a sort of a, a trio that people go, yeah, there was a father who had two sons. I get that one. Jacob famously ends up with 12 sons by four different women, plus a daughter. Um, a complicated era, isn't it? So, prodigal son, Jacob, Esau, and daddy, Isaac. So far, you know, you've got three blokes, so the same as the prodigal son story. But what Bailey says is, there's a lot of similarities between Jacob, Esau, and Isaac with the prodigal son story. There's also a lot that just sort of stands out to you and goes, this is really really different. And why is Jesus taking this familiar thing and sort of subverting it? And it tells us an absolute ton about Jesus if we can get into the Jacob and Esau story. So here's Jacob and Esau. They've been born uh, grabbing at each other. And one of the first things that happens back in Genesis chapter 25 is the story of the birthright. Now birthright meant that when your dad died, you got twice as much as any other sibling. Um, but also, and very, very importantly in this family, you got the right of the sort of spiritual um, flow to come down through you. Now, why it was so important in this family is that God had met with Abraham and told him to go off to a foreign land and he'd make his descendants as many as the, the stars in the sky or the sand on the sea. And that just worked. It just worked like extraordinarily. In fact, some Christians will talk about the blessings of Abraham and say, it's really key for us that we are Abraham's children because the blessings that flow to this man are now ours. We are Abraham's children, spiritually. Because wherever Abraham goes, it just goes superbly well for him. He goes up a hill and he says to his nephew, "Um, you can choose the best land, I'll have the rubbish land. Guess which one works out best? Abraham. You get onto Isaac's life, And God says to him, because of Abraham, I am blessing you. Now, there's not much really about Isaac in Genesis that you go, wow, what a great guy. In fact, he's a bit of a wuss. He's a bit of a sort of passive, sort of standoffish guy. I mean, he lets his dad take him up the mountain to be killed, you know, age 13 or so. He'd be like, you know, come on. He lets his uh, mummy choose him a wife through his dad's servant. And he's just like, okay, whatever. Uh, He lets his sons have a complete Barney and Tiswas, and he's clearly motivated by food in the way that Esau, his second son, is. 
um, because he wants him to give him a stew before he'll give him his blessing later on. And he's also a bit of a whinger. We know that because when he's just beginning to lose his eyesight, but 30 years or so before he actually dies, he calls his sons together and goes, I'm dying. (laughs) Come and I will give you a blessing. But he's not dying. He lives for another 30 years. So the guy's a closet whinger. You know, he's, he's not a particularly impressive character. But here he is between Abraham and Jacob. And if you were a Jew in Jesus' day, you would talk about being the descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. These were like your holy trio. And not quite your holy trinity, but your holy trio of founding fathers. You'd want to know what was going on for them. And partly Jesus in telling the story is sort of unpicking just how messy and unsavory their story is. Because if you've ever tried to do the Bible in a year or you've just started at the beginning and read through, you might have found yourself scratching your head going, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to get out of this story today. For example, Abraham, the great father of faith, ends up going to a foreign country and his wife, it turns out, is still really good looking even though she's super old. And he's worried that someone wants to sleep with her and that they might sleep with her, but in order to do that, they might kill him first. So he passes her off, his wife off, as his sister in case they want to sleep with her, which they could get away with if he's just sister. (laughs) And um, and he he doesn't just do that once, he does it twice. Isaac learns from dear old dad and does the same thing with Rebecca. They're like super dysfunctional family. This is like a soap opera on TV gone wrong. And yet they're the sort of the founding fathers of the Bible. By the time you get to Jacob and Esau, Rebecca and Isaac have traded off which of the children they actually like. Uh, Rebecca likes Jacob and Isaac likes Esau. Now that's not a good recipe for family harmony, is it? And mummy, it turns out, is a manipulative old so-and-so. And and she decides that when she overhears Isaac say, I want to give you a blessing, Esau, that what she should really do is get Jacob in and preempt the blessing. So she gets her son to lie to his father, to dishonour him by turning up badly, to cover what is supposed to be his brothers, and basically steal, to break four out of ten commandments which haven't yet been given to Moses. She and Isaac uh, presumably have been a bit of a love match. Uh, He's certainly not had any other uh, wives in that time, unlike his his sons, Uh, but uh, it's it's not going very well. Anyway, Isaac, who thinks he's dying but isn't, uh, sends it for Esau and tells him to go and make a lovely meal for him because he'd love love one of Esau's lovely meals. Rebecca makes a lovely meal out of just uh, uh, some of the, the flock and sends Jacob in all dressed up as a hairy man like Esau is, et cetera, et cetera. And I think you've, you've probably picked up the story. Basically, Jacob gets away of it for the second time. Not only has he stolen the birthright for the price of some soup, he now steals the blessing uh, by trickery. And you say, well, what, why does it matter? Why, do, why does it matter, these blessings? But in the Old Testament... The verbal blessings that you passed on down the generations were powerful. In fact, we still believe that in church today. That's why we'll finish a service with with a blessing. And when we say the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we expect that to have an enormous power, enormous impact on people's lives. If you go into a house that might have uh, felt weird or even haunted in some way or sort of oppressed in some way and you pronounce a blessing on it, you expect that blessing to evict anything malevolent from the house. You expect it to be powerful and to shake out things. When we were in Uganda the other week, the bishop was talking about someone who had come up to him who had been a witch doctor and he just the witch doctor couldn't cope with the bishop. There was something he was just like shaking against him. He couldn't cope because the blessing on this bishop's life was too powerful for the shady witch doctor. The blessings are powerful and they're flowing down this way from Abraham through to Jacob. And Jacob's got the whole lot. And Esau is understandably completely cross. So what happens next is Rebecca, to save her favourite son's life, sends him off into exile, the younger son goes off into exile. That's the parallel, again, with our prodigal son story. And he ends up looking after um, flocks, uh, slightly ruined uh, flocks, a similar-ish sort of way to the prodigal son. 
uh, and he meets a, a lovely girl out there that he wants to marry. Now, the second biblical way to get a wife uh, in Genesis is to work seven years for her. Um, and then as a sort of price of your labor, her father will uh, give her to you as, as a bride. Unfortunately, Jacob, he wants to marry uh, the lovely Rachel, hasn't reckoned on her father, uh, Laban, who is the brother of uh, Rebecca. Because Rachel has got a sister called Leah, uh, who, the Bible says she's got dodgy eyes, but I mean, you imagine maybe she's got a few more dodgy things going for her than just her eyes. Because what happens is Jacob wakes up, presumably after quite a heavy feast, um, wedding feast night, um, looks in his bed and realises after the whole night that it's Leah who's lying there next to him and not Rachel. It's pretty dysfunctional, yeah? Her father has sent the wrong bride into the tent to sleep with future son-in-law. And he obviously complains the next day. So Laban, the father-in-law, says, ah, well, spend the week with her, with Leah. (laughs) You have her for the week. And at the end of the week, I'll give you Rachel as well. You can have them both. In our culture, you've got to marry the oldest one first. Um, You can't just have the youngest one. Um, But if you work for another seven years for me, you can have Rachel as well. So uh, two for the price of two is the the deal that he's got out of this. And it causes no end of aggravation. Now, in God's mercy on Leah, he enables her to start having lots of children, which, of course, in those days is is a wonderful thing. And eventually she has Judah. And I think that's maybe her fourth son. And by the time she's had the fourth one, she goes, I will praise God after all. The first ones are like, I'm fed up of this situation, is what she names them. And Judah is like, actually, I'm going to praise God. In the meantime, Rachel hasn't got any children at all. She's like got a big fat zero on children. Uh, and Leah is getting all of their love in terms of production. And so they then do, oh, do, do you know the story? They then go, we can have even more children the way that grandma did it. And grandma, uh, Sarah, had had her servant, Hagar sleep with Abraham, which produced Ishmael, uh, Isaac's forgotten brother. And so what they did is they pass off their servants, one after another, to Father Jacob, who then proceeds to have more children with the servants. And so eventually Rachel uh, gets Joseph, um, which was made famous by Andrew Lloyd Weather um, with his technical dream coat, and a young guy called Benjamin who comes after him, which makes 12 sons and one daughter along the way. So he's worked, Jacob's worked for seven years for, for Rachel, and then another seven years for Rachel, and he's got Leah in there as well. At the end of those 14 years, uh, he hasn't really got much property. So he says, well, let me work a bit longer, and I'll have the flock which are spotted or metalled, you know, the, the slightly ruined crops. Then he does this very bizarre thing of, uh, breeding the, uh, the animals in front of some stripped uh, bark, which seems to make them mottled for no apparent reason apart from Abraham's blessing seems to be flowing to Jacob. So he's prospering even when he's as deceitful as Laban is. Jacob literally means deceiver, and yet he's prospering because he's getting the full blessings of Abraham down. Okay, so far he's there in exile. How do we come back to the prodigal son? Well, after a while, Laban is getting really fed up of him and Laban's sons are getting really fed up of him as well because it seems that all the prosperity is going Jacob's way. So Jacob's sort of stuck. Either he stays with Laban and his sons who want to kill him or way back home, his brother Esau, big brother Esau, who also, incidentally, probably wants to kill him. But it's been about 20 years by now. So maybe, maybe it's worth taking a risk. So Jacob goes back from a country that he's a long way off in and uh, it's not quite like the prodigal son. Because remember the prodigal son, he's been eating the pig swill and he goes, you know, maybe I could go back and be a servant to my father. He'd treat me like a hired hand. I could come home and be just a servant. And he's almost repentant, but you can't quite tell if he is. He's just, you know, trying to worm his way in. Well, Jacob's properly not repentant. Jacob has got a tactic to appease big brother Esau. Guess what it is? He chooses his least favourite concubine and least favourite children and puts them in the front row of this enormous parade that's going to go towards Esau. 
Then he chooses his next least favorite concubine and her children and puts them in the next row. Then he chooses his least favorite wife, puts her in the next row with the children. And then he protects his, uh, his final wife and child there. And then he hides behind the whole bunch of them <laughs> and walks out to meet Esau. But the amazing thing that happens when you get over to chapter 33 of Genesis is the phrase that you'll remember from, from Jesus' story. While he was still a long way off, his brother ran towards him. His brother ran towards him. It's not old man Isaac who runs towards him, the guy who thought he was going to die 25 years before. It's his brother who's running towards him. And you're like, wow, is this the amazing reconciliation? Is this the fatted calf moment? Is this the moment where he's going to go, my brother was lost and now has been found. He was dead, but now he's alive. Well, not a bit of it. There's a right little trading off thing going on. Um, siblings can be rivals sometimes, can't they? I was reading a little, uh, I was trying to find a good joke about siblings, I couldn't find one. Uh, but what I did find was a story of three siblings whose mum was sort of getting to the point where she was going to work out who got her inheritance. And they, they were fairly wealthy. So one of them said, you know, I'll buy her a big house and um, she, can, she can live in the big house. The other one said, well, I'll buy her a car and a chauffeur and we'll drive her around. And the other one was like, well, she loves the King James Bible. I'll train a parrot to recite the whole Bible to her. So every time she's lost or lonely, this is before you know, Amazon and Alexa and all that sort of thing. Uh, every time she's lost and lonely, the parrot will pipe up the King James Bible at her. Um, the first son goes to see his mum a few, a few weeks later. She says, ah, oh, you could sell the house, son. Uh, I can only really live in one of the rooms. I don't need all that space. It doesn't really work for me. The second son goes along, she says, I don't like the chauffeur. And frankly, I just want to sit and be left on my own now. I don't want to be chauffeured around the place. Uh, And the last son comes in and uh, she says, oh, that was such a thoughtful gift, son. Thank you so much for the chicken. (laughs) It's the way you tell them, isn't it? (laughs) That that was was tired. Anyway, um, (laughs) Anyway, siblings get into rivalry. These two are in full on collision course. Full on collision course, because Esau is running towards him, but Jacob's still petrified of his big brother. He's not done anything to build any real bridges with him. And Esau says, come home with me. And Jacob's like, no, I'm not going to come home with you. Tragically, because that, what that does is that Esau goes back down to his place and Jacob goes to a place called Shechem, which has already got a ruler there who takes a fancy to his only daughter, And one of the sons of the ruler ends up raping his only daughter at that point. So the dysfunction between the brothers leads to the rape of his daughter. It's a horrible, horrible little sort of moment in the the scripture there. And that then leads to a massacre and and a whole load of stuff. Um, But Esau's also like, well, let me leave some of my armed men behind to help you. And Jacob's like, I'm not going to have an assassin in my tent so they can kill me in my sleep. So he's like, totally dysfunctional. And Here you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the guys of promise. You know what happens next, right through to the end of Genesis? It's the story of Jacob's 12 sons and Joseph. Joseph basically takes you to the end of the book of Genesis. You know, Joseph and his brothers who sell him into slavery and want him dead. And it's just a mess. It's a mess. And you're like, this is not a story you could found a religion on. (laughs) You know, it's a bit like the Church of England being founded on Henry VIII. You're like, this is not a good starting point. You know, hopefully it goes back before Henry VIII to a better start. But it's pretty similar to a Henry VIII sort of dynasty. You're like, these guys are screwed up. And Jesus comes in and his story has a different character in. Of course, he has the prodigal parent. Uh, the, The father figure, who's also a bit like a mother. We'll pick up on that more in a couple of weeks' time. And that's a very different character, the one who runs and reinstates and makes them well. But there's something about just how dysfunctional this lot is, and I think can give us some real hope. Because there is only one hero in the scripture. There really is only one hero in the scripture. And some of the time I think that as Christians, maybe, maybe it's especially for Christian blokes, I'm not sure, but we're, we're sort of like, we've got to measure up against uh, our siblings. And maybe it's the siblings you can see around. You think, you know, I'd love to be as good as uh, a Sam or Joe or, or Tillam at the back there. I'd love to be as good as those guys. Sometimes it's like, I've got to measure up against my big brother 
Jesus. <laughs> and he's perfect, and that's really annoying. Like, uh, having a brother who's perfect is properly difficult to deal with, isn't it? There's Jesus. And actually, the story of the patriarchs in the Old Testament is quite similar to, not, well, actually, they're not anywhere near as bad, the, the apostles, but they're also pretty dysfunctional in their own way, aren't they? The apostles have got their own dysfunctionality, even though they've got the Holy Spirit working in them. Uh, and none of them are heroes. None of them are heroes. And friends, you don't have to be a hero in this story either. You really don't. You don't have to be a hero in this story. You don't have to be the Messiah. You don't have to be the one who's got it all right. Because he's already got it right for you. It doesn't mean you just do whatever you feel like and get away with it. But it does mean that the thing that saved Abraham is the only thing that's going to save you and me as well. Which was not how well he treated his wife or how well he treated his sons or grandsons. It was the fact that he had faith in a God who could save him even though he wasn't perfect. And God credited it to him as righteousness. And sometimes we can look at ourselves, do a bit of a self-audit and go, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a failure. And uh, the Bible sort of goes, yeah, all right. I, I, this might not be the wrong assessment. <laughs> you know, maybe you are. Most people through history, it seems, have been. Given the opportunity, most of us would be more of a mess up than we are. If we thought we could get away with it, what would we get away with? And yet what God's looking for in the midst of all that mess is just people who go, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but when you call me, I'll answer. When I hear you whispering my name, I'm going to come running. I'm going to trust that even though I'm not perfect on my own, that if you really want me, then I believe that and I'll come running to you. These guys were a total mess. Yet by the end of Jacob's life, he's wrestled with God, had some dreams and revelations, and it's pretty much like by the time you get to Joseph's sort of end of his story, you think, ah, oh, Jacob's come a long way. And it'd be great for us, wouldn't it, as well? if when we get to that last five, 10, 20 years of our life, you can look back and go, yeah, I've got a long way. I might not have been perfect. I might not have got everything right. I might not even have been the hero of my own life stories. I thought I probably would be when I was 15. <laughs> Wasn't a hero at all. But he actually proved to be a hero in a way that that song Joe was singing was saying. And my testimony is he was faithful to me. However much I tried to go wrong, however much I messed up, he was faithful. And when I look back at the story of my life, there is a man running towards me throughout my whole life. And he's my heavenly daddy. He's my heavenly daddy. And whatever I did, however I messed up, he still said, welcome home, lad. Welcome home. Welcome home. See, that's Christianity. That's grace. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome to come home. You're welcome to come home. Not because you were great or worth it, but because he says, welcome, come home, come home, come home. You don't have to defend yourself anymore. You've just got to come home. You don't have to prove yourself anymore. You've just got to come home. You don't have to beat your brother or sister anymore. You've just got to come home.